Hey everyone, today on Big Al Books, I'm here to do my June wrap up, and I have a feeling this video is going to get pretty out of control since I've got about 20 books to talk about and very little time to film, edit, and upload this video because in less than 24 hours, I'm going to be on a plane on my way to France for a summer vacation for two weeks. So I really wanted to get this video finished before I go on vacation because it would be a drag to have to talk about all 20 of these books weeks after I've read them. So I do apologize if I end up sacrificing some quality for quantity in today's video, but it is what it is. So in the month of June, there were kind of two categories of books that I was trying to prioritize. It was Pride Month, so I was trying to read some books by some queer authors or about queer characters. And then also in Canada on June 21st, it's National Indigenous Peoples Day. So throughout the month of June, I always try to prioritize reading some books by some First Nations, and Inuit authors. In today's video, I'm going to start off by talking about the books that I read for Pride Month, and then we'll get to the Indigenous content in the second half of this video. But before we get started, I do have three books that don't relate to either of those themes, so I guess we'll start off with the random ones first. Uh, one of these is a reread for me, and that was A Cut Witch by Nnedi Okorafor. This is a YA coming-of-age story about a girl who feels like an outsider because she has albinism, and she's from America, and she's living in Nigeria, but she's bullied, she doesn't feel like she fits in, and then she discovers that she has these badass magical powers, so she has to learn about this whole secret society that she never knew about. I first read this book back in February, hoping that it could be a text that I could use in my English as a second language class, and we did pilot this this novel this year and I did really enjoy discussing this novel with my students and the other big plus with this one is that there's not a lot of content available online about this book so my students had a pretty hard time plagiarizing so that was a win about this one and I'm hoping to use it again next year. Next up I have The Sun King by Nancy Mitford. This is a brief biography of Louis XIV and I wanted to pick this one up because I will be going to see Versailles when I'm in France and I wanted to learn more about the king who decided to create this palace and what life was like for the people who lived there. And this book definitely did give me some answers, but I will say that I don't think that this book is the best entrance point into the topic because Nancy Mitford isn't really interested in giving clear definitions or overviews. I think she expects you to have a pretty good knowledge of the king and she just kind of takes you from different episodes of his life and it's not always the most linear experience. So this could be a bit disjointed. But what I did like about it is that she's not very stuffy or academic in tone and it's a lot more chatty and conversational where she's just trying to give you some of the gossip. So this is great when she's talking about his mistresses or about how ridiculous French medicine was at the time. So there are some definite fun moments in this book but I will say now I'm reading Nancy Mitford's biography of Madame de Pompadour and this one's just a lot stronger where her writing style is really shining in this biography. I don't think that she was quite as successful in The Sun King but it was still a cool book to check out and I did learn a lot. And for my last wild card pick, I have The Scarlet Pimpernel by Baroness Orsi. Kind of like The Sun King, this is a book that is set in France, but written from more of an English perspective. So this is a classic of the masked Avenger genre. It's about a guy who is going and sneaking into France and saving some aristocrats from the guillotine. So this book is just really over the top. And when I was reading the first chapter, I thought that it was really entertaining because it is just so biased against the French Revolution. It's really trying to depict the revolutionaries as these bloodthirsty monsters that are just going after the poor innocent aristocrats and they're just reveling in the blood and the destruction around them. So I thought it was kind of funny, but I'm sad to report back that I did not enjoy the rest of this book nearly as much as I did the hilarious first chapter. And part of my problem with the structure of this book is that the reader is spending their time through the narrative perspective of this woman who has no idea who the Scarlet Pimpernel is and it takes about like half of the book for her to figure out who it is but then of course like the identity of this person is revealed on the back cover of the book so like I knew the whole time and I felt like it was just very slow paced watching her try to go through the realization of who it was and then the second half of the book is more action-packed and adventurous but I didn't really enjoy just going through the plot and finding out what was gonna happen it seemed pretty predictable the whole time I'm sure that this book seemed much fresher when it came out over a hundred years ago but by today's standards I thought the plot was pretty conventional so while I did enjoy reading about what the French Revolution might have seemed like to certain people living in England across the channel I don't think that this book had too much to offer me beyond that so I'm glad I checked it out but I didn't love it 
love it. Moving on to the books that I read for Pride Month, I've got two more novels that also appeared in the first decade of the 20th century, like The Scarlet Pimpernel, but these are both written by queer female authors. So the first one is... Claudine à l'école by Colette. I have to say I was not prepared for how scandalous Claudine à l'école was as a book because, you know, you think that teenagers over a hundred years ago would have been more wholesome living in these small towns in France, but no, this book is narrated by a fearless teenage girl who is not afraid to write about all the intimate details of her life. This is basically about a love triangle that is going on between a teenage girl who has this big crush on the headmistress's teacher assistant who then starts to have a lesbian affair with the headmistress herself. So these two school teachers are having this like big affair kind of in front of their students, like everyone's aware of it. But then they're also bringing in all these other third parties and these other male teachers into the drama as well. So <laughs> there's a lot going on. And there's also this district superintendent guy who comes to the school to give medical checkups to the girls who's like a huge pervert and everyone seems to know that about him. So it is a wildly inappropriate reason by today's standards. I will say that there's not a ton of plot in this book so like there's not really a lot that's happening but Claudine does have a very charming voice and it does make you want to follow her adventures. Next up I have Three Lives by Gertrude Stein. Stein was a lesbian author who was very highly influential to many future American writers and oh man I am sad to say that I hated this book. This is probably one of the least enjoyable reading experiences that I have ever suffered through. Now the premise of this book doesn't sound too bad. It is about the lives of three different women and they are the kind of women whose stories had been ignored in fiction for a really long time. So I get that this is an important project, writing about the lives of hardworking immigrants or biracial people and I get that that's valuable but also the way that Stein was trying to write this book made for a really excruciating reading experience. So from the little amount that I've read, it sounds like she was trying to replicate a certain style of modernist painting that created a mood using these thick repetitive brush strokes. So you can see that she's kind of trying to do that with her writing, but the thing is like looking at a painting you don't really notice how repetitious it is, but when you're reading a book and you've read the same sentence for the third time on the same page, it grows really grating. So I did not get on with her writing style. As a testament to how much I truly hated this book, I thought I would bring in a character witness to the stand here. Uh, Taylor, are you with us? Uh, just to verify how much I really hated reading this book. Uh, yeah, yeah, she would not stop talking about how much she hated it and how much of a chore it was to read. Like, oh, Taylor, I have to read Gertrude Stein again tonight. I'm like, you know, you, you know you don't have to, though, right? No, I have to read Gertrude Stein again tonight. I still have 20 more pages to do. Yeah, every uh, time I picked it up, I think I complained a lot. So actually, yeah. I had a bad experience, but maybe you even had a worse one. I mean, apparently, I didn't have to actually read it, and apparently that was brutal, so yeah. not so bad. Thank you, character witness. See you later. Next up, I'm going to talk about three graphic novels that I read that are centered around queer relationships between young people. The first one of these was Laura Dean Keeps Breaking Up With Me by Mariko Tamaki. It's about a girl in high school named Freddie who has this really problematic relationship with this popular girl, Laura, and they keep breaking up and they keep getting back together. And it's a kind of like cute little high school drama and it's about her learning how to become a better friend and how to take care of herself better which sounds kind of cheesy and it's not the type of thing that I would usually go for, but I do enjoy Mariko Tamaki's work, especially the work that she does with her cousin Jillian. Um, she is working with a different illustrator here, so I found it didn't have the same magic as when the two Tamakis are working together, but I think it's still a pretty enjoyable story. I think especially if you are a teenager, you might relate to this more than a bitter old lady like me, but it was a still pretty cute story with some solid characters and a good message. The next one that I read was Bloom by Kevin Panetta and this is another one that I feel like was really centered at a teen demographic but this one for me like just didn't work at all. I found this way too cutesy to be enjoyable and I felt like the characters were just like quirky and I really couldn't stand them. I will say one of the guys who's in the main relationship was a really awesome dude but I didn't really like the other guys so I didn't want them to get together and this book is really centered around 
baking and figuring out what you want to do with your life and those are not things that are very relatable to me but I'm sure that it could be meaningful for someone else if you are someone that maybe has a heart and isn't totally repulsed by cute things so it just did not work for me. Then I read Blue is the Warmest Color by Julie Moreau. This graphic novel is a work in translation. I think it originally appeared in French and I found it really interesting to read after reading the other two more contemporary graphic novels because this is set during the 90s and even though that's not like that long ago you can tell how there's been a real shift in many societies about how queerness is accepted and how young people feel about being queer because the main character in this book starts to realize that she has feelings for another girl and this book really shows how this character is terrified of her sexuality and how she is so uncomfortable and she's in denial and she is just not willing to accept that part of herself nor are her homophobic parents or her friends at school. You can just really see how it was just not accepted in the community where she's living, whereas in the characters in, in Bloom and Laura Dean have these really supportive and loving family and friendships. And the angst in these books is not coming from the characters trying to determine whether they're queer, but it's more about their specific relationships that they're in, where this is more about a character that is going on that journey trying to accept who she is. Not surprisingly, this graphic novel is a lot more tragic than the other two as well even though there are some really beautiful and tender moments that show what it's like to fall in love with someone you do see all of the bitter moments as well in this relationship so I think that this was a really valuable story there was a plot incident in here that happens that really sets things into chaos that I thought was a bit ridiculous so that removed me a bit from the story but it still was a beautiful story and I love the way that color was used throughout the book and I thought it was an interesting one to read in comparison with some more contemporary graphic novels. I actually have another graphic novel to talk about that can serve as our bridge over into the second part of this video where I talk about some of the indigenous books that I read to honor National Indigenous Peoples Day. And this is a graphic novel called Wendy by Walter Scott and I just picked this up at the bookstore knowing nothing about it because I thought the characters just like made really weird funny faces so I thought it was just gonna be fun and then I ended up looking more into the author and he's actually from the Kanawake Reserve in Quebec. So he is a First Nations author and he also seems to be pretty well respected in the Canadian art scene Which is funny because this comic is just like so dumb But entertaining and it is really just ripping on the pretentious art scene in Montreal The main character is Wendy and on one side She's like this really plucky up-and-coming artist and she has all these big dreams and plans for future projects But then in her real life Wendy is also like this kind of lazy procrastinator and she's also this this party monster who makes all of these poor decisions with her bad crowd of friends. So it was just kind of making fun of some of the people in this art scene and the dysfunctional relationships that they have with each other. But I thought that this was just such good fun. It really did make me laugh. And even though it is kind of ripping on Wendy and the crowd that she runs with, I thought that there was still some heart in the story where you did feel sympathetic for this character and, and you do really want the best for Wendy, even though she never seems to get her shit together. Next up I have two poetry collections by queer indigenous authors and I'm always the worst about talking about poetry so I'm not going to do either of these collections justice but I will just give you a little bit about what each of them are about. Um, the first one is This Wound is a World by Billy Ray Belcourt. He is a gay author from the Drift Pile First Nation. And a lot of these poems are about relationships and intimacy and how the act of loving someone can be this kind of radical form of self-affirmation and identity building. So they're both engaging with what it means to be a queer body in the world as well as an indigenous person and they were quite beautiful and some of them got into some theoretical language as well which I thought was a really nice combination where it had this really thoughtful analytical language but also these gut punch emotional moments as well. There's a lot of empathy, warmth, and heart to this collection, so I think Billy Ray Belcourt is an author I will be keeping my eye on in the future. I also read Holy Wild, the new collection by Gwen Benaway, who is a trans author of Anishinaabe and Métis descent. And I have heard so many good things about Gwen Benaway from other authors in the community that I really wanted to give her work a chance. And I'm glad that I did because I don't think I've ever read poetry from a trans perspective before. And I think that there's just something that is so metaphorical and rich about poetry that can just help you understand someone else's experience 
audience in a really powerful way. All of these poems seem deeply personal, so it seems like Benoit is writing about things that are very close to her own life experience, like what it's like to transition into a new gender, or what it's like to experience relationships with other people as a trans person, and also, of course, being an indigenous woman in the world. I appreciate how Benoe would incorporate Anishinaabe language seamlessly throughout her poems, and I loved this concept of holy wild, the sacredness of living free in your natural state, leaving this world of captivity, and almost having to relearn what it means to be wild. So. This poetry collection had me thinking a lot. The poems weren't always written in what would be my favorite style of poetry, but I will say that this was an incredibly valuable read, and I will need to go back and check out some of the works in her back catalog as well. Next up, I have some nonfiction books to talk about. I usually find nonfiction to be my kind of homework reading of the month, but this month I really enjoyed all of the nonfiction that I was reading. So the book that I picked up specifically to read this month was one called No Surrender, The Land Remains in Indigenous. This was written by Sheldon Krasowski, and this book is an in-depth examination of the numbered treaties in Canada. And if you feel like your eyes have glazed over, I understand that it's a very specific niche of history, but one that I find particularly fascinating because the numbered treaties cover huge swaths of Canadian land. And basically the treaties are the legal foundation of Canada as a nation, so it's really interesting to go back through the history and study how these treaties were made and some of the unethical things that were happening during the treaty making process. Now Sheldon Krasowski is not an Indigenous scholar himself, but he did consult with lots of Indigenous scholars and he is also paying attention to the oral histories because for a long time a lot of treaty history has come from the written treaty documents themselves which are of course quite biased. So he is looking at some other sources. I thought this was really fascinating from that kind of historiography perspective. Basically in this book Krasowski walks you through each numbered treaty, he gives you some historical context for why the treaty needed to be made, he gives you information on everyone who was involved, what their motivations might have been, and he's trying to highlight some of the things that each of these treaties have in common with each other or ways that they might have been a little bit different. So by the end you do have this very clear picture of the whole thing. And what makes this book particularly interesting is that he argues that one of the key negotiating strategies of the treaty negotiators was to really highlight and talk about all the benefits of signing the treaties without really mentioning any of the drawbacks that would happen. So while the language in the treaty was very clear that indigenous people were signing and ceding away their land forever, that information wasn't clearly being communicated to the chiefs. And Krasowski keeps trying to show us that the chiefs were not just these silly people that were tricked by the white man, but they were actually actually shrewd negotiators, so it just calls a lot of things into question. So I thought this was a pretty radical historical read. I also thoroughly enjoyed learning more about Canadian history by reading this illustrated comic strip biography of Louis Riel by Chester Brown. I think it is so cool that this book exists. It's such an accessible entry point into Canadian history, especially if you're one of the many people who thinks that Canadian history is boring. I mean, Riel is such an iconic and controversial figure of Canadian history and there is nothing boring about his story. So he was a Métis leader, he was living in what became Manitoba and had some problems with the Canadian government so formed his own provisional government which turned into this rebellion and the Canadian government was not keen on him and once he ended up coming back to Canada they decided they had to get rid of him and he was executed. So he is still today a pretty controversial figure because for some he's this heroic figure who stood up against the tyranny of the Canadian government and demanded justice for his people. But to others, he was kind of this mentally unstable person who committed treason. So, you know, depends where your outlook is. I feel like Chester Brown did not compromise any of the ambiguity of the real story. And he always gave you lots of different ways to interpret the events that were happening. Especially, he did really thorough notes in the back of this. So he does explain where he's getting his information from 
from, which historical sources, and why he might have changed some of the details. So it is really thorough, but it's also just like entertaining as heck. So this was just such a fun way to get this story. I can't recommend this one highly enough if you're looking to learn more about Canadian history. And it was also a great book to read at the same time as No Surrender, since it is dealing with a similar period of history and different consequences that happened as a result of these treaties. I also got around to reading this biography of Buffy St. Marie by Andrea Warner. Buffy St. Marie is a Cree singer-songwriter, musician, educator, wonderful human being, and I believe she was born in Canada, but then she was adopted and raised in the United States, so I think, you know, she has ties with both countries, and she's just such a wonderful person that it's just really inspiring reading about her life and getting to hear her own thoughts on the experiences that she's had. So I will say that this is kind of like a basically constructed biography. But I found that this is written for like a very mainstream audience. Whereas if in an interview Buffy mentions a certain topic, then the book will explain the American Indian movement was this, this, this. So if you're a reader that's familiar with a lot of these concepts, it will seem kind of basic how the author will explain them. But if you are someone who's unfamiliar with a lot of Indigenous terminology, then there are lots of definitions in this book that will help you along. So I will say that I didn't think that it was the most artfully constructed biography, but Buffy St. Marie is just such a cool person. So that was really what made this work shine because her voice is just present throughout the whole text. And she just seems like such a positive and cool person. And I found it really inspiring how she was such a game changing musician from the 60s onwards. And she never had that typical rock star career of someone who became like really greedy and self-centered and involved in drugs and all that. She just was always herself and she always continued to innovate. She got involved in technology and in educational action and even the music that she's been coming out with in the last 10 years is some of the best music of her career. So she's just such a cool person to read about. So I'm really glad that I checked this one out, especially because it inspired me to listen to more of her music, which has been very enjoyable. The last nonfiction book that I read this month was Why Indigenous Literatures Matter by Daniel Heath Justice, who is an author from the Cherokee Nation that now lives in Canada. And this was just such a delight to read. I think if you're someone who is brand new to getting into Indigenous literature, or if you're someone like me who's been exploring it for a while, then I think everyone can find some kind of value in this book because it just places all of it in this larger context. And he's sort of exploring some common themes that many Indigenous authors are exploring in their works. I really appreciate how this book was structured and how Daniel Heath Justice used these kind of key questions as a way to ground his discussion. So the four key questions that you explore in the book are, how do we learn to be human? How do we behave as good relatives? How do we become good ancestors? And how do we learn to live together? So he would take each of those questions as this jumping off point to examine the different ways that Indigenous literature can go about answering some of those questions. And I really like how it valued the past, the present, and the future. So there's some wonderful content in here. There's especially a great chapter about how Indigenous authors are using science fiction and fantasy in really creative ways. And what I really liked is that he uses so many specific examples and quotations of passages from books that that, you know, you read this book with a greater appreciation of Indigenous literature in general, but you also come away from it with this really long reading list of books that you want to check out after Daniel has written about them in such an interesting way. Even though I will say that for a few of the books that he talks about, he does talk about the plot in depth, so if you're someone that doesn't like spoilers, maybe you should check out the book before you read his full synopsis of it. But this book is just so wonderful, and then at the back there is like this full appendix full of recommendations recommendations. So I have so much reading to do after reading this book and I feel like it's given me so much to think about in my future reading. Next up I've got four novels to talk about. Two of these novels are written by some of my favorite Indigenous authors and two of them are written by authors that were new to me. So let's start off by talking about Celia's Song by Lee Maracle. This is a book that I've owned for a while but I've been saving for a special occasion because it's always such a rich and rewarding experience when you dive into a new 
new Lee Miracle novel, and I knew that this one was going to be special because it's a continuation of the world and the characters that she introduced in her novel Raven Song over 20 years ago. And since that was one of my favorite reads of two years ago, I knew that it was going to be really wonderful returning to this world, which it definitely was. It was great to see these characters again many years in the future, but also I would say at least the first 100 pages of this are very different in tone. Many of the central characters are not even humans. So for example, there's a two-headed sea serpent that used to guard the front of a longhouse until the people stopped honoring the serpent. So the snake has kind of taken off and is causing trouble in the world because each of the heads have different wants and desires and one of them is a lot more destructive than the other ones. And then also one of the other central characters is this seer who is named Mink. So he is in this animal form and he is bearing witness to many traumatic events throughout history and he's the one who connects with Celia, one of the main characters of this book who is also a seer herself. So the first 100 pages of this book can be a bit difficult to find your footing because you are jumping around from vision to vision. I will say that the narrative does get more conventional and easy to follow in the second half which is much more character based. But I do love that this novel had both of these styles of writing in it. The Miracles novels are not the most accessible or action-packed but I find that that if you are able to slow down and really immerse yourself in the world that she's creating, it will make for such a rich reading experience. Her books are steeped in Stolo culture and mythology, and they can really teach you so much about human nature. So I always value a reading experience with Lee Miracle. So once again, I have to bow to the queen because this was another outstanding novel. Another novel I read was Love Medicine by Louise Erdrich. I read my first Erdrich novel last year during the month of June. I read The Roundhouse and I had been wanting to go back to her work ever since so I was glad to get around to her debut novel this month. And I think I like Love Medicine even a little bit more than The Roundhouse since this is a multi-generational family novel which is one of my favorite things to encounter. But this novel almost reads like interconnected short stories as well since it's not just like one continuous narrative but rather it's giving you different snapshots in time through the life of two branches of a family. So it made for a really compelling full picture of the lives of these characters and how they intersect with each other. And it's always fascinating seeing a character at multiple points in their life and how they change and how they are viewed by their family members. So this was just gorgeous and generous novel. It's one of those ones that's hard to believe that it's a debut novel since it just seems so mature and insightful about life. I will say that I think I preferred the stories that were more from the beginning of the collection that were set further back in history. I just found that these stories seemed to be bolder and more steeped in myth and they just seem to be a bit stranger whereas the ones that were more contemporary were a bit more familiar so I think they were all strong but I just found the book a bit more mysterious in the first half. I also enjoyed how the tone of these stories would change depending on the personality of the narrator. You could feel that Louise Erdrich had a distinct voice for each of these characters as they narrate their story and some of them are using a lot of humor to tell the these comedic tales and some of them are using more poetic language to tell more tragic tales so I thought it hit a variety of styles and moods and had such a rich collection of fascinating intersecting characters so this is a brilliant debut novel and I'm excited to continue on with my Louise Erdrich adventure good thing she has so many novels for me to keep working my way through Next up, I have The Bone People by Carrie Holm. She's an author who is from New Zealand, who I believe has some amount of Maori heritage. So I'm not sure if you would classify her as an Indigenous author or not, but I do know that she considers her Maori heritage to be very important to who she is and she does try to include a lot of Maori language, terminology, and cultural ideas in this book. Now whether she was successful at incorporating those elements is another kind of question because this is a book that I find really difficult to talk about since it was a book that just really confused me on many levels. So this is one that I was really anticipating reading. I read the first chapter of it in a trial 
five chapter tag and I thought the writing was just so cool and different and I knew it was a Booker Prize winner. The reason why this is such a confounding book is because there are so many legitimate cool and unique features about this book and yet there are also so many drawbacks and things that just don't seem to fully work in this novel that then remove you from the story. So I think that I want to make a video where I can explore this in greater detail because I just don't have time to do that in a wrap up like this because this is just a really fascinating book. I'm really glad that I read it, but also it was really frustrating on the other hand. So this is the story about this woman named Carowin. She's this failed artist who's estranged from her family and she lives in a literal tower at the edge of the seashore, which is so dramatic. I really like that. One day Carowin finds that there is a strange boy in her tower. He's got a cut on his foot so she's kind of trying to take care of him but she doesn't really know what's going on because he can't talk and then she eventually ends up forming this strange close relationship between this boy and his Maori father Joe but then you also find out that they have a complicated relationship. Joe has ended up adopting this boy and while they're really close their relationship is also abusive. So it is the strange exploration of these three characters and how they come together and how they're pulled apart. So on one hand it's this really fascinating character study, but on the other hand the story goes into some places that I think most readers are going to be heavily uncomfortable with and I can usually handle a lot of traumatic stuff happening in a book and even I felt like I was pushed a bit to the limits with how we're supposed to see this story all wrapping up together in the end. So like I was saying there's some really strong points about this book. I mean the writing is just unique and the characters are really jumping off the page but on the other hand the writing is also very unstructured and it can be really messy and frustrating and there are some just very strange elements about this narrative. So I I do hope that one day I get my thoughts together and talk about this book in depth because I think it's just an interesting experiment but I'm not sure that it worked. The last novel I was able to squeeze in at the end of the month was Trail of Lightning by Rebecca Roanhorse. Rebecca Roanhorse identifies as an Oke, Owinge, Pueblo, and African American writer and this is the first book in her Sixth World series. This is a post-apocalyptic series that takes place in a world that has been ravaged by climate change and environmental catastrophes to the point where one of the only inhabitable places left on Turtle Island is the Dineta, which was formerly the Navajo Reservation. And certain events that have happened have triggered this entry point into this new sixth world where all of these monsters and mythical figures are kind of coming back and wreaking havoc on Earth. This book in particular follows the adventures of Maggie, who is a monster hunter, and some of the characters in this world World are gifted with these clan powers which work out to be almost these supernatural gifts which in some ways are, are good things. They give you these strengths and abilities but on the other hand Maggie is noticing that she is kind of losing control on who she is as a person so she has lots of struggles throughout this book to determine whether she is doing the right thing by killing all of these monsters and she's just trying to figure out what kind of a person she's going to be. So this is like a very fun and fast-paced series while on the other hand it is very dark and violent. So I thought that made for an interesting mix because this is an engaging book that you don't want to put down because you want to find out what's going to happen next but at the same time so much messed up stuff is happening on every page. So I thought this was a pretty cool read. And I'm not usually the biggest fan of post-apocalyptic novels, but I thought that the way that Roan Horse is incorporating Navajo mythology into this book is so compelling that I am definitely curious to continue on with this series. I think the second book in this has dropped, but I don't have a copy of it yet, but I'm hoping to get to it sometime this summer. And lastly, I have a short story collection called Moccasin Square Gardens by Richard Van Kamp. Now he is a member of the Dene Nation, which I think is interesting because in Canada, the Dene people live very far up north in the Northwest Territories, but actually the Dene people um, also traveled down south uh, to become the Navajo people, which you read about in Trail of Lightning. So I think it's kind of cool reading about the same culture that is in two different parts of the world. So this is now I think my third Richard Van Camp short story collection. So I really know what I'm getting into when I go into his works. Like I find that his stories are always very enjoyable and imaginative, but I don't think that he's the most skillful writer. In fact, a lot of his dialogue and his jokes can be really corny at times. Now usually Richard Van 
Van Camp's stories are set in this small town and there's a lot of returning characters, but I will say that these ones didn't seem to reflect as much on the Northern experience, and I think that this was a bit more lighthearted and comedic in tone than some of his previous collections. I'm glad I checked this out even though it's probably not one of Van Camp's strongest short story collections, but I did really like the story about the corrupt band chief who gets publicly humiliated in front of the whole community. That one was very funny and I always love a good revenge tale. So there are some highlights in here and it's just an easy read to flip through if you like some good stories. So I'm glad I returned to Van Camp and I'm sure I'll be reading more of his stories in the future. So that's it for all the books that I read this June. I'm probably going to be taking a bit of a break from filming while I'm away on vacation but hopefully we'll see each other soon by the end of July. Please let me know if you read any good books in the month of June or if you have any summer reading plans. I'd love to hear about what you're reading. Thanks so much for watching this way too long wrap up and I'll see you again later. Bye.